Today we're going to be tearing down a Ford Duratec V6 engine to see what's inside and how it works. Now this one's out of a 2010 Ford Escape. They're actually surprisingly reliable for a Ford. Taking a quick look around here, we do have a plastic intake manifold with plastic valve covers, aluminum head and an aluminum block, and of course an aluminum oil pan. Coming around the back here, we do have a drive-by wire throttle body, cooling manifold, but the interesting thing is the water pump is located on the back side of the engine, driven off of a secondary accessory belt. First thing we're going to do is remove the intake manifold. On the back side here, there's a bracket. See how pesky these hose clamps are from Ford. And with that out of the way, I can lift off the intake manifold. Now this engine debuted in 93 and it was done by 2012, which means that we've only got port injection. Direct injection didn't come until the EcoBoost series. Now the fuel injection is located under this rail here. The intake plenum before that is looking pretty cringy though. I'm going to remove the fuel rail. At least they have a separate connection here for the engine wiring harness. So I don't have to disconnect everything individually. Okay. Just got my wiring harness removal tool here. Now I'm going to remo remove this lower half of the intake manifold. And you can see it's pretty dirty. And that's because the fuel only gets injected after those runners. All that gasoline is making me feel high. Now this is actually a stretch belt. There's no tension around here. Alright, stretch belt. Just going to use my wire harness removal tool here. Next I'm going to remove the water pump. That's actually the thermostat. At least it's made of metal. No, I stripped it. Alright, here's the water pump. Water pump has plastic impellers and has a very tiny amount of place, so it is worn. I gotta say, accessing this part in the car with the transmission stuff in the way is a little difficult, especially compared to the front of the engine. Alright, next up I'm gonna work on getting this coolant manifold off. There's a hidden bolt under here. Ten nuts now. Oh, we got coolant. Let's remove this from the studs. Now, there's the coolant manifold. I heard these engines like to eat ignition coils, so I'm going to break these off. They can get this dipstick out of here. It basically fell off. Alright, next up I gotta get this valve cover off. And I'm not looking forward to these bolts which are so crusty. So wish me luck. And then just loosen it with the ratchet first. Yes! And I just gotta do that a dozen more times. I got them all free without stripping out, so let's take them off. These hardwares were completely rusted. Compared to any other vehicle that has a 14 euro engine, this is not acceptable. Inside that valve cover is really clean though. Taking a look under the valve cover, you can see things are pretty clean. This was a working engine after all. It has variable valve timing on the intake side, which you can see here. And on the exhaust side is what drives the water pump over here. Now this version, which is the 240 horsepower updated version, uses roller arms underneath to compress the valves. Earlier versions have the cam directly contacting a mechanical bucket that pushes down on it. Nice to see that using a chain instead of a belt, the next generation Ford Escape actually used the belt in the EcoBoost versions. This is the oil control valve, which I'm going to remove. Now this is an interesting design. It's got a giant coil in here, and that's going to cause this little pin here to push out. And when it pushes out, it's going to push on this tab over here, which is going to fill this thing up with oil in order to do the cam phasing. It's just sad though that this is internally accessed. You have to remove the valve cover if you need to change this for any reason. Here we are on the rear bank. I'm going to remove these ignition coils. Just throw those away. Yeah, the hardware is just as rusty as the front. So I'm going to take my time and go around. And I'm going to slacken these up. Oh, that one skipped. Alright, it's going to take a while. Best thing is to use your brother's toothbrush. And go in here and clean out all of these holes. The recessed ones were the worst on the front. At least it's not so bad back here because the plenum was covering it. Alright, I got them all loose. Pop off this valve cover here. Taking a look under the rear bank, just like the front, things look pretty clean. This is only slightly more tarnished, probably because of the PCV system. Everything looks fairly intact. We do have our timing chain and our P and our oil control valve over here. Just going to remove this PCV valve before my wife beats me up because we got to go to Costco now. Here we go. So now we've got the valve covers off. I'm next going to jerk off these cam phasers here. Knock off these tens here for the engine mount. Some long bolt for a ten head. Let's get the tensioner off. These are the cam position sensors that are going to pick up signal from these little nubs on here. And that's how it's going to know how much this cam is phased. See if I can bust off this 18 mil crank bolt. Now this is a press fit, so it's going to be tight just like your... These Harbor Freight tools don't really work out. Check out how bent this pin is compared to the jaws. If you're Canadian, you know that Princess Auto is a lot better. Alright, next up I'm going to remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that go around this timing cover. Let's remove this timing cover. 
cool. Gotta say for a cover, this is one hefty piece. Taking a look under the tining cover of the Duratec V6 engine, things are actually pretty simple under here. We got our double overhead cams. There's two separate chains, one for the left bank and one for the right bank. Each has its own timing chain tensioner. And then at the bottom here, the oil pump is direct drive. There's no extra chain for it. Very simple setup. This here is the trigger wheel for the crank position sensor. I'm gonna go ahead and start removing these chain tensioners. That wasn't very violent at all. I'm going to remove this chain slide. Now this one just has a pivot that it comes off of. Now this timing chain guide is made of plastic. This one's made of a die cast aluminum, but the actual slide part is made of plastic. There is a bit of wear near the top here where it was grazing something. I'm going to remove the tensioner side guide here. Again, this one's made of plastic. That camshaft just jumped. Now the tensioners are actually oil powered, so they have the spring mechanism in there. This here is the ratchet mechanism, and here's where the oil will go in, so it's actually a hydraulic tensioner as well. I'll remove this guide over here. Now this guide is surprisingly made of all plastic. And I'll remove the chain over here, and the chain over here on the right side. And then remove the crankshaft gear. At least this is keyed. Harmonic balancer itself is actually not keyed. In typical Ford fashion. Usually the springs are pretty tight in variable valve timing gears, but this one I can actually move it by hand. That's pretty interesting. So let's remove these torques. And what do we have inside? Variable valve timing gear. Now this one's a little bit interesting. It's got a little plunger inside of here. And as we saw earlier, the actuator for the oil control valve is also a plunger so it's going to push in on this piece over here and what that does is it activates the oil passages inside of here to fill up this gear with oil if i take this off you can see also here on this camshaft oil actually flows through the camshaft through these little grooves inside of here and it's just waiting on that plunger push in in order to fill this with gear and phase the cam timing if you want to learn more about variable valve timing i do have a video linked above next up i'm going to remove the camshafts these are eight mils no Generally the cam bearings are in good shape. There's just this one here that has a slight score on them The ones in the exhaust side are a little bit worse, but not terrible The camshafts themselves are in pretty decent shape. Looks like this gear is actually pressed on here Let's remove the cams on the left side of the engine. Whoa, that just spun around for no reason Seems like the exhaust side on this engine fared a little bit worse. Alright, there's a little 8 millimeter bolt here if I can move that out of the way, and is there another one on the other side? Oh, there we go, there's the exhaust camshaft. Alright, so here you can see the roller arms. There's nothing really latching it onto the lifter inside of here. Now, the engine had two different designs. One was direct cam on bucket, which would just press the valve down. And then there's this one here. The advantage here is that you've got this oil line running inside of here and then these lifters which are going to be pushing up on this roller over here so there's no issue with valve clearance and no tapping. You also don't need to do a periodic valve adjustment the way you would if you had a cam on bucket design. I mean as lazy as Ford Escape owners go, would they really do a valve adjustment? They'd probably just throw the whole car away. So I'm going to remove all of these little rollers. At least you don't need a special tool to take this off. And if you're wondering, this engine was actually designed by Porsche and they sold the engineering to Ford so they can use it in normal cars like the Ford Contour. Kind of a real waste of resources if you ask me. Next up we're gonna give this engine head. I mean the bolts. These are only 13 millimeter headed bolts which is pretty small and that's all that's holding your engine head together. Now one of these guys don't really have a big brain. They say jeans are made of cotton. Well real jeans at least. So I'm just gonna use that to sap up some of this coolant. Alright next I'm gonna bang these bolts loose. Oh no. More cooling. Luckily, I do have a drain pan down here. I care about the environment, uh, unlike some people. All right, fine, in with the kitchen pan. If we can take this off right now. Whoa, there's like a whole bunch of coolant in here. Person did not drain any coolant at all. Okay, there's coolant in the cylinder. It's not supposed to happen. All right, I see rust and my bet is that's just, that's just water from having an open intake and exhaust manifold. Okay, so let's do the head bolts on the left side. All right, that one's dry. Now this fellows is a dumb design. Putting a rubber hose in the middle of the V of any engine, it's gonna get really hot and wanna crack. And look what you gotta do in order to get to it. You gotta pretty much tear down half the engine in order to access this clamp over here. I'm gonna remove this PCV cover. It's for PCV and there's a gasket there. Cripsy this gasket is. All right, nice time to turn this engine over to work on the bottom. Be sure I'm gonna make a big mess here. Actually, this is coolant inside of here if you think about it. It's yellow. 
Just like all the other coolant. Here comes the oil. Oh, that's a lot of oil. All right, this is the part where you just roll it. Clean up the mess later. Eights, tens, thirteens, and fifteens are the only sockets you really need for this engine. Here, press it. Aluminum oil pan guys, you see that? This is before Ford had trust issues and moved all to plastic, which is obviously not good because those can crack and leak. At least this one will be a little more sturdy. We're gonna remove all the 13s going around, holding it on to the block. Oh, there's the gasket. Now when an engine is sold to you as a good working engine, you don't expect to find junk inside of the pickup tube. And check out the amount of particles inside of the oil pan. This is kind of sad being from an engine that quote unquote had no issues. I mean you'd expect to find this kind of stuff at the bottom of your brother's wardrobe but not inside the bottom of a mid mileage engine. This is pretty bad. Now those chunks look more like sludge to me so let's continue tearing this down to see if we can find more evidence. This is interesting, they use like self-tapping coarse threaded screws here. Let's see what lies within. Okay, the bottom of that's pretty clean. This just tells me that the oil had a bit of sludge inside and was sitting over here. Jeez, that Honda Civic. All right, I'm gonna remove the 10s and 13s to hold this on. And they got some nuts for my collection. Most engines come with bolts. I'm gonna remove the oil pickup tube. And here's a closer look at what's inside of there. Looks like we do have a couple of chunks that got picked up in the screen. Yeah, it's got more of that paste on there. In fact, my entire socket set's getting that paste on it too. I'll tell you one thing, this thing is a pretty thick steel and it's heavy. I wonder if it's actually meant to be a structural part. Now what's actually structural is that this entire thing is a ladder frame and forms kind of an upper oil pan that bolts to the block. Makes things a lot stronger rather than using individual bearing caps. Now there's a couple of 15s, 13s, and a bunch of 8s that run along here, so let's take those off next. Let's try the old Ugga Dug and see if that'll break it off. This thing's a lot stronger since I did the warranty. Let me know if you guys warrantied one of these before. Take off the 13s around there next. Got 18s, 15s, 10s, 8s. There's so many things holding this piece on. I'm gonna remove the 10s next. I think the engine should be light enough to hold itself now. That's why I need nuts for things like this. Haven't used my half inch drive 10 mil in a long time. Found this socket in the junkyard. Some poor soul lost their 10 millimeter socket. I'm gonna remove the connecting rod caps next. Yo, these are not even 10s, bro. To one time you actually use your 11 millimeter socket. I'm gonna remove the next set here. So now that we know what the oil pan looks like, these bearings don't look too bad. There are a few lines on this bearing over here, but overall it's in decent shape. Now I'm just gonna use my piston removal tool and push down on these connecting rods so we can get them out of the block. Taking a look at the piston, things don't look very well. You can see there's a lot of carbon built up around this piston here. The worst part is really the oil control ring, which is this ring at the bottom here. It's supposed to be nice and corrugated to allow oil to flow down underneath the piston over here on its downstroke. But instead, if they're blocked up like this, all of the oil is going to end up on the top here and just get burnt. This engine was definitely burning oil. You could also see a little bit of skirt wear on the outsides over here. This is why swapping in a used engine is kind of a risk. You don't really know where you stand with things like oil burning and head gasket issues until you actually install it into the vehicle and end up with these problems. So now the engine's all apart. Let's take a quick look at the oil lubrication system. Now we saw the pickup tube come off of here where the oil is going to start at the bottom of the engine. I'm going to then remove the oil pump here so we can take a look. Oh, we got some oil dripping out. We've got some torques over here that we're going to remove next. Let's open up this oil pump. This is a gear style oil pump. You can see how the crankshaft is going to drive this. You've got the input here, the oil pickup tube, and the output where it goes directly into the block down at the side here. They call them wife beaters, but you're legally not allowed to beat your wife. So the next best use is to actually wipe up things like oil. And let's take a look at the condition here. Taking a look inside of the oil pump housing, you can see there is some scars inside of here, like some material ran through here. But moreover on the housing over here, you can see there's a definite scar over here and over here. Gears themselves has some minor scratching on them, but they are a lot harder because it's made of steel. One thing I do like is that that oil pump is gonna send oil down into the block directly, straight into the oil galley to the oil filter. It doesn't have to pass through this upper oil pan. I'm gonna see if we can get this oil pan off here. Oh, this is a big heavy piece here. Take a look at the wear on that bearing. That's pretty rough. The other ones do have a bit of wear. I'm surprised these actually have more wear than the connecting rods. Now the actual crankshaft itself looks like it's in decent shape. I don't see any wear marks on it. So let's see if I can pop this out of here. This is the rear main seal by the way. Oh, 
nice heavy piece. So here's where the oil will come from, and that's how it would get lubricated. Splitting off of that main galley, we got one that goes to the head over here, and then we've got some going to the chain tensioner, one chain tensioner two, and another one going to the other head. Looking at the top of the block here, we do have this cavity which leads down to the sump. That's for the PCV system. Now interestingly, this Duratec engine uses a semi-closed block design, which means that the cylinder walls around here are not open to coolant. In fact, it's actually closed up in between here, and that gives it a lot more strength. Overall, this engine does have a very simplistic design, and that kind of lends to its reliability. Now the head gasket that fell off of these things are pretty crusty and cripsy just like my foot after wearing slippers for the whole summer. However, I'm not really seeing any obvious signs of failure. This is a multi-layer steel gasket. Now the rest of the block itself is actually in decent shape despite what the bearings and the oil pan looks like. This could definitely be saved for a coffee table or something. By the way, sorry for the airplane noise. I live one kilometer from Canada's largest airport. Taking a look under the heads, there's not much to see here. It's just a very nice V shape with the intake and exhaust ports. Looks like this bank was burning a little bit too lean as these exhaust valves are white compared to this bank over here. Now at the bottom over here and here is where the oil holes are going to go up to power the variable valve timing and lubricate everything up top. Oil from the head is going to make its way up to these two galleys over here which are going to run the length of the head. Now that's going to power these hydraulic lifters which as I mentioned before are going to take up any lash between the camshafts. But you can see these camshafts also got holes in them that are going to tap off of there to lubricate these bearings. Looks like there used to be a sensor on this PCV hole. The valve cover itself is composite and it does have quite a bit of weight to it but of course with all plastics they will eventually warp and leak. Finally the intake over here does have a drive-by wire throttle body and a manifold absolute pressure sensor at the top here. There's no tumble flow control in here it's a very simple basic manifold. Overall I think the Duratec V6 engine is a very simply designed engine. I actually kind of like the design. I'll leave judgment for the execution part up to you. The Duratec is probably one of those forgotten engines but everyone's gonna start remembering it now because the EcoBoost engines have a lot higher failure rate than these. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one. Oh yeah, and if you are buying a used engine, buyer beware because you could end up with something like this. Make sure you get one with a warranty or just be like me, buy them really cheap and scrap them after.